advocate for plus size models in the industry. How do you think there's a pressure to stay thin for these individuals? Well, it's such a huge conundrum for me. Um, the fashion industry writ large is always looking for a new, a new muse to hold up and say this is what everyone should look like. And it's very unnerving. And the industry does react. I'll, I'll go back a number of years. Um, there was a time when there was a, a, an outcry against eating disorders that so many models on, on the runway had very palpable, demonstrable eating disorders. And that was sending a bad message to young women and women, period, everywhere. Then it was a case of the models were adolescents. They hadn't even passed through puberty. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones walking in the runway. And then it was felt that that wasn't exactly the right body image either. And were you aware of the whole era of um, Russian models who had had limb lengthening? Yes. Yes, another atrocity. So you're parading that around saying, this is the woman you should be. And I got into a lot of trouble last fall because I was asked the question, I didn't speak out on my own, I was asked the question by the Huffington Post about how I felt about transgender male to female models on the mm -hmm. runway. And I said I was very much against it because once again, the fashion industry found another body type that was unattainable by most women. Because you, when you have the transgender surgery and hormones to go from male to female, it doesn't alter your skeleton. And men don't have hips. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's a serious issue. Diane von Furstenberg, who's the president of the Council of Fashion Designers of America, has, has been a, an advocate also about healthy women walking the runway. And I hope we can make some change and some headway. But I will add, I think the bigger conundrum for me is what's available in the retail world. And the, the, uh, the choices are so slim and limited. And I find it repugnant, to be perfectly honest, because most women in this nation are larger than a size 12. And that's a lot of buying power. And why can't the needs of those women be better addressed? Okay. So do you think that the fashion industry is creating this negative image, especially for college students? Yes, I do. I mean, I, I, I can't gloss it over and say, no, it's, it's an unfortunate side effect and, and consequence. It's simply the, the case. But let me also say that for the, for the fashion industry, um, when I was speaking earlier to students here, I was talking about how most women, and some men, but certainly most women, want, want to look as long and lean as possible. And that's what you see walking on the runways during the, the various fashion weeks around the world. You see body types that are uh, unattainable by most women. And for the fashion industry, that is a walking fashion illustration. And fashion illustrations are not um, proportioned the way that we are. They're, they're exaggerated proportions in terms of height. Um, so... I wish I knew better how to get at the core of it. If I were actually designing a line of clothes, I would proudly have women who are real sizes walk down the runway and show people how fabulous they can look. So obviously technology is playing a huge role in the fashion industry, especially with things like airbrushing, but do you see that technology is also benefiting the fashion industry in a positive light? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I believe in the power of technology and, and the positive impact of it. Um, but like any, any form of technology, there's good and there's evil. And I'm, of course, an advocate for the good. And we just have to keep our eyes open that we're not bamboozled. So we're sitting in Des Moines, Iowa, and obviously the Midwest isn't necessarily known for their fashion style. So what would be your advice for staying on trends in the flyover states? Well, I have to say, this was the best, best dressed crowd of students I've ever been before, <laughs> quite honestly. So I'm going to be an advocate for Des Moines style, uh, <laughs> or certainly Drake University style. I mean, my advice is the same for everyone, regardless of gender or age or lifestyle. The key to getting your fashion right has, has to do with three elements that sound intangible, but in fact, when they're in harmony and balance, they work beautifully. The three elements are silhouette, proportion, and fit. 
And that's what it's all about. You can have a stunning wardrobe that you spent a fortune on. If the fit isn't right, if the proportions aren't, aren't right, forget it. You're, you're, you're not going to look your best. So, and, and I have to, have to add, I really believe in shopping on a budget. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that expensive clothes are necessary. I don't even, I don't even believe, in, believe in buying them. I, I, I say all the time um, that $2,400 dress, can't you spend half as much and still have something that's fantastic and give the balance to charity. Do something for people. I say the same thing about ex- expensive handbags. I can't imagine walking around with a handbag that costs thousands and thousands of dollars. Why? We I have mean, a lot of college students will be happy that you're saying Well, and that. also, I, 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 don't, I, I believe it's so easy to become a fashion victim when you're walking around with all these branded items and, you, and you're basically flaunting conspicuous consumption. And fashion victims are victims, and, and they look like they're trying too hard. Whenever anyone tries too hard, in my opinion, they fail at, at whatever they're doing, whether it's fashion or a term paper. So you're most notably known probably by popular media through Project Runway, and it's now on its 13th season, yes. which is very exciting. But do you think that it's a show that's going to become relevant still? Do you think that there's still this attention to watch the show, or is it kind of losing its value with being into a 13th season? Well, our ratings have never been higher. Okay. So uh, there's always a new group of individuals who are introduced to it. Mm-hmm. Um, when people ask me whether I'm tired of it after 13 seasons, I, I taught for 29 years. Every semester I had a new group of students. I was constantly energized and invigorated and inspired. And that's how I feel about the Project Runway designers. In fact, I've never been as invigorated and inspired by uh, 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 another season as much as I have this one, <laughs> season 13. And I, I have to say, I, I, I felt it at the auditions. I, I try to attend all the auditions. Um, and I asked designers very talented, mature people. Uh, we've never seen you before. Why, why now? Because I'm used to seeing a lot of the same designers over and over and over again. And this was a whole fresh crop. And they said, well, the economy's better, and it's a better time for, for my brand. So I'm, because th- this really is a, a launching pad and a catalyst for getting their brand out there. And that's true. For so many of the years of Project Runway, the, the economy was in terrible shape. Mm-hmm. And it is healing and repairing now. So Fashion Week was just last week. Yes. Were there any um, standout contestants that you can maybe hint about a little bit? Oh, well, we had nine designers show at the Project Runway show because we we can't show our hand about who the finalists are. We have to show the same number of designers who are currently on the season. I've never seen a stronger group of of shows, to be honest. I haven't. I thought they were sensational. Fabulous. Is there any trends that you think are going to be really big this year, seeing Fashion Week? I have to be honest. I'm rather cynical and jaded about the whole trend issue, (laughs) Um, especially from runway to the stores, because what really matters is what the buyers buy in the showroom. And I'm not saying it's a game of bait and switch or um, a shell game of mirrors, but what's on the runway and what is in the showroom, generally it it's, has the same DNA, but they're different items. Mm-hmm. So what the, what the consumer will actually experience can be different. So for me, it's what's in the stores that really determines all of this. So, and I don't know what the buyers are going to buy. So what are a few items that you think all college students should have in their wardrobe? They should have a dark wash pair of jeans... Um, no fraying or dis- or, or um, distressing. Um, they should have a good white top like you're wearing, and frankly, a blazer like you're wearing. When I say blazer, I don't mean a, a classic Brooks Brothers navy with <laughs> gold buttons. I'm talking about something that's that represents you. I mean, it's the easiest way to dress up a t-shirt and a pair of jeans. I'm glad I got the Tim Gunn approval. You do, most definitely. <laughs> I'm glad you're wearing this. This is a perfect example. <laughs> Did you see yourself kind of shifting to be this um, household name for everyone? Oh, you you flatter me. I, of, of course not. I mean, I thought I would retire at Parsons and never dreamed of leaving. Um, and I, I mean, my whole life has been had been academia. It's all that I really knew. 
And even going into the, into this world, it, it's it's a funny story. I mean, I, I said earlier that I was originally a consultant, and, and my role in the show didn't exist, and it came about at the very last minute. I think fear-based, because the producers thought the designers wouldn't speak. So send, send him in, and they'll say something. But it's reality television. I mean, I was an unpaid consultant. I wasn't paid to be on the show. I went into season two. I wasn't paid. Um, at the end of season two, I was at a GLAAD Media Award uh, dinner in Los Angeles, and I met the man who would become my agent. He said to me uh, something about who represents you, and I said, no one. And he said, no one? I said, what do you mean? You've done two seasons of the show. And I said, well, I'm not paid anything. I don't, why do I need representation? He said, you're not paid anything. <laughs> I said, no. I said, it's reality television. No one gets paid. He said, oh, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. Wow. <laughs> so you always are known to say, make it work. How would you apply that saying to just a lifestyle? Oh, I, I mean, I say it to myself every day. Um, life is rife with frustrations and uncertainties and derailments, and we can't run away from it. I mean, it's, it's just there. We have to face it and examine it and make it work. It's about taking the... Um, situation at, that, that's at hand and turning it around. And I find that with each make it work moment that I have, and certainly that my students have had, it, it's like putting more um, arrows in your quiver or, or ingredients into your medicine bag. Um, you just have more resources that you bring with you to whatever the next problem it, it, that you need to solve will be. But if you just run away from these situations and think, I can't handle this, mm -hmm. then you don't really learn anything. And I think that not only do you have more resources, there's a booing of your self-confidence and self-esteem and your morale. And you feel that you're ready to tackle the world when you can make it work. Great. Well, thank you so much thank for you. sitting down and talking to me. It I really appreciate it. It was a lovely experience. Yes, thank you.